Hi there. Uh, my name is Hassan Salam. I uh, work for Alexandria University, where I am professor of obstetric gynecology. Today, I'm going to continue our discussion about the management of the infertile couple. And today, I'm going to discuss the other factors in infertility and unexplained infertility. Uh, as mentioned before, this presentation consists of four parts. The first part was about the introduction and the male factors in infertility. The second part was about the ovarian factor in infertility. This current part is about the other factors, namely the cervical, the tubal, the uterine, the peritoneal factors, and also the unexplained infertility. And finally, uh, uh, we'll have a part four uh, to discuss assisted reproduction technology. Now, according to uh, Michael Hull, uh, in his uh, important study in uh, 1985, uh, published in 1985, the cervical factor made 70% of his cases. So what is the cervical factor? What is the function of the cervix? Well, the function of the cervix is twofold. It is a sperm reservoir, and it is also uh, 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 the place where sperm capacitation takes place. And on the left side, of course, we have the anatomy, and on the right side, we have um, um, a diagram showing uh, the intricate uh, uh, anatomy of the cervical canal. Uh, above, we have the internal os, and below, we have the external os. And above the internal os, we also have the isthmus. And as you can see, uh, at the time of ovulation, the best time of ovulation, the day 12, for example, uh, where we have the maximum estradiol concentration in plasma, we will have this estrogenic type mucus and uh, which is arranged in, arranged in a matter in a way to allow the sperms uh, to penetrate in fact uh, with this intricate um, um, uh, distribution it will allow the sperms to remain in the cervix uh, also in the different glands these racemose glands that you can see uh, they will remain there and will they will, will migrate in um, um, different waves uh, according to uh, uh, the uh, subtle uterine contractions that the woman may not feel due to the presence of proxylodendin F2 alpha in the semen, therefore carrying the sperm to the ampulla of the, uh, the fallopian tube where fertilization will take place. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the function of the cervix rib. It acts as a, a sperm reservoir, and also uh, it acts. It uh, it is the place where we uh, sperm capacitation takes place. But what is sperm capacitation? Really, sperm capacitation consists of the uh, removal of the albumin and other substances which are covering the head of the sperm, because these are important to remove if this sperm is to be able to uh, penetrate the oocyte. And this uh, place and this takes place in the cervical uh, mucus. And people working in this field, uh, well, well, in the field of assisted reproduction, uh, they know that we cannot take the sperm as it is and put it on the oocyte if we are going to do in vitro fertilization. We have to do what is uh, similar to capacitation. We do, for example, the swim up technique or any other uh, sperm preparation technique. And when we do this, we will discuss it that after this uh, treatment of the discapacitation, the sperm will start moving vigorously, particularly with a side-to-side -side nodding movement of the head, which is important for the sperm to negotiate its uh, path through the corona radiata cells surrounding uh, the oocyte. Uh, now, uh, capacitation was the, very well described by uh, Professor Jan Kramer, uh, many years ago, and as you can see here, uh, the sperm with the native sperm, which is deposited in the vagina, uh, where if we try to recover it from the other side, inside the uterus, we will find that it has been already capacitated. And as I said, this is important for uh, the sperms, which are seen here in green, uh, to negotiate themselves be be, uh, between these uh, yellow uh, granulosa cells, which are surrounding the oocyte, the largest um, cell in the body, uh, which is here in pink, uh, in this uh, beautifully illustrated uh, treated photograph 
taken by scanning electron microscopy. Uh, now, around the time of ovulation, uh, um, cervical mucus stages take place. In fact, also, as you can see, the cervical diameter itself is uh, 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 the cervix opens, it is uh, more open than at any other time of the cycle, particularly around day 12 of the cycle, with the maximum estradiol concentration, as I said. The quantity of the mucus is increased, and also the capacity of the sperm to make uh, threads is also increased at the, around that time, and also arborization, which means that if we put some of this cervical mucus on a slide and leave it to dry, we will find this ferning um, um, arrangement uh, like the uh, trees or like the palm trees, uh, what we call arborization from arbre in French, and then this is due, of course, to the formation of sodium chloride uh, crystals. And this is a photo of um, cervical mucus taken uh, on day 12 of the cycle in a properly ovulating woman. Uh, then if we look by uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, we will find that around the time of ovulation, day 12 in particular, uh, the left side, the arrangement of the mycelia of the mucus are uh, the type E for estrogenic, which allows the sperm to penetrate, as you can see, while on the right side we have the G type, which is present after ovulation, uh, like uh, G for gestational with the um, pro secretion of progesterone, then the effects of estrogens are uh, opposed, and then the mucus will take this shape, preventing any further sperm to go inside the uterine cavity. And this is also the arrangement at the beginning of the cycle before estrogen uh, um, reaches a certain uh, level. So what are the causes then uh, for cervical infertility? Well, we can have many problems. We can have infections of the cervix, tumors of the cervix. The cervix, the cervical mucus may be insufficiently produced. And also we can have an immunological problem and for due to anti-sperm antibodies present in the cervical mucus. Now, different sorts of infections, we know them. Here is an inflammatory erosion. This is trichomonas originalis. The, on the right side, we have uh, monilia. Uh, and these are all uh, sorts of infections which may affect uh, the, uh, the, the, the motility of the sperm. Uh, and therefore, they can affect uh, fertilization uh, um, uh, negatively. Uh, also, uh, cervical polyps may be present. Uh, at the cervix, and as you can see on the left side, the small polyp, but this can be even uh, larger, as you can see on the right side. Uh, again, the insufficient cervical mucus uh, production can be a problem, particularly if uh, the woman has had treatment with uh, cautery. Sometimes people use cautery to treat infections there, and therefore they uh, will affect the, the, the glands of the cervix, particularly those inside the, uh, uh, the endocervical canal, and if they go inside with uh, uh, the uh, cautery probe, uh, this may affect the cervical mucus. Also, chronic infections can affect the uh, mucus, and also some people are just born this way, or maybe the receptors of the cer cervix are not uh, responding to the higher increasing levels of estradiol. And finally, uh, we know, of course, that some estrogen receptor modulators used uh, for ovulation inductions like clomiphene citrate for example may affect negative they are estrogen selective modula mo uh, modulators um, and we know that estradiol has two receptors there's an alpha receptor and there's a beta receptor so they may act on one receptor uh, in the hypothalamus and pituitary uh, inducing promoting uh, ovulation while on the other side they will go uh, to the other receptors in the cervical in the cervix and lead to um, um, uh, mucus which is um, not uh, properly produced uh, the other thing of course is the uh, anti the presence of anti-sperm antibodies in the cervical mucus and as we can see them here uh, they can lead to immobilization of the sperm and lot not letting the sperm go through the cervix in order to fertilize the oocyte. So what is the, the proper way of evaluating the cervical factor in infertility? Well, the best way of evaluating it is to do the postcoital tests, or previously called the Sims-Huhn test. 
And then out of this, we can also do some sperm mucus penetration tests or anti-sperm antibody uh, tests. So what is the postcoital test? Now, the postcoital test is not a test to predict the long-term fertility potential of the couple. It is just to make sure that at the time of ovulation, uh, this cervix can uh, act as a good reservoir. It is a test for the cervical reservoir function of the, um, of the cervix. So people have intercourse and we see them the following day. We don't see them immediately, two or three hours after intercourse, because sperm will live anywhere for three or four and even five hours. Uh, when intercourse happens, a, a, a big amount of sperm escapes from the vagina naturally, and this is why nature has given uh, the husband millions of sperm. So naturally, a lot of sperm will escape. But if the cervix is working as a good reservoir, it will keep some of the sperm for a, a long time, up to 24 hours. In fact, um, sperm can remain in, the in a good cervical mucus for three days and four days and five days and six days even. I think the, the, the maximum is seven days recorded. Uh, and of course, when we do this test, we need to make sure that we are doing the test at the right time, that the lady uh, at this time is at the maximum uh, estrogen production, say day 12, in which case we will find ovulatory signs by ultrasound, we will have a nice follicle by ultrasound, and maybe also a triple uh, um, um, pattern of uh, the endometrium. Uh, the postcoital test itself is divided in two parts. The first thing is to examine the mucus itself, and if the mucus is good, then we will start looking whether it contains spermatozoa or not. So on the right side, we have uh, fertile mucus, this arborization, uh, which is shown, as I said, uh, if we leave uh, the mucus on uh, uh, slightly dry, it will show us these ferns, while on the left side, we have the example of an infertile mucus. And in fact, there is a score for the cervical mucus, which was introduced by Professor Bucklap Insler uh, a long time ago, 1972. And as you can see, uh, we look at the amount of the mucus, the viscosity, the furnace, the spinbarkite, and the cellularity, and each one of them has a score. And if the total score is out of 15, and if we have a mucus of more than 10, it is a good score. But anyway, if we see that the lady is producing a uh, good amount of uh, mucus, which is um, uh, acellular, we don't have uh, uh, cells, and it is uh, uh, threadable. And uh, uh, so we put it on the slide and look and look uh, whether it contains spermatozoa. And uh, uh, again, the second part is to see whether there are spermatozoa and whether these spermatozoa are remote, mobile or not. And this was a test introduced even uh, earlier by Gordon Swire in 1955. So as you can see, we like it. We like to do uh, to see a good number of spermatozoa, uh, like between six and twenty spermatozoa per high power field. So that's a score of two, and the motility of at least 50% of them moving. So we give again uh, two or three. So uh, ideally, we would have a, a test of. of uh, 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 a spermatozoa of 3 over 3 and 3 over 3, but if we have 2 or 3 or 2 over 3, that will be normally would be a good test which will allow the lady to become pregnant. So, if the test is negative, what do we do? Well, in the past, people wanted to know where is the problem. Is the problem in the sperm or is the problem in the mucus? So, they would do, as we see on the left side, the so called slight sperm mucus penetration test. They would put uh, a drop of, uh, of the mucus of the uh, woman and a drop of the sperm of the husband and see whether the sperm of the husband will penetrate the mucus or not. And they sometimes could do this. Uh, do this in a crossed manner, meaning that uh, uh, using again a donor mucus and a donor sperm and do it in a crossover fashion to see what the problem is exactly. Uh, alternatively, uh, they would use the uh, uh, test introduced by Jan Kramer on the right side where you have a special slide, where, a glass slide, where you have three small reservoirs uh, uh, at the bottom, you can see, and where and these uh, um, reservoirs, you would put the semen of the husband and the semen of uh, 
a donor and again a mucus of the husband mucus uh, mucus of the uh, of the woman and the mucus of a donor and see do again the test in a crossover way to see where the problem is and see the migration of the spermatozoa along the um, this slide uh, as you can see it is divided into centimeters and so on uh, these tests are really cumbersome tests and then I don't uh, yeah, I mean they are good theoretical tests but to cut a long story short really if we have a negative test it means that the possibility of pregnancy in this lady is not very good therefore uh, the idea is then to go ahead with intrauterine insemination if the sperms do not find their way on their own and we know that this lady has ovulation and she has uh, um, uh, patent uh, fallopian tubes then we would opt for uh, intrauterine insemination uh, sometimes when we do the postculture test we find that the sperms are there but they are moving in situ they are not moving progressively and this raises the possibility of the presence of again um, antibodies because some women have anti-sperm antibody antibodies in the cervical mucus uh, which can uh, uh, prevent the sperms from moving properly uh, so um, um, there are tests to check for these antibodies there are tests to check for these antibodies in the woman's serum in the first place and also to do the same test in the cervical mucus some of these antibodies uh, uh, produce agglutination of the sperms and they are called the sperm agglutination, agglutination test or the Kibrick test there is a sperm immobilizing test which immobilizes the, the, the uh, um, uh, spermatozoa uh, like the Isojima test and then we have also the cytotoxic test with uh, the sperm antibody cytotoxic test which uh, um, shows whether this uh, mucus of the, of the lady has antibodies which will kill the uh, uh, spermatozoa and again it is really a theoretical test because as I said if we don't uh, we're not happy with the way those the sperms are behaving in the mucus of the woman then the short uh, and direct answer is to uh, do intrauterine insemination but sometimes we find that the problem is simpler than this and then well, this is where we can treat the cervical factor uh, as follows then if we have polyps for example we'd remove them surgically if we have an infection we would do give the appropriate antibiotic uh, after doing a cultural sensitivity test if we think that the mucus is not being produced properly despite the presence of good ovulation then we will see why maybe we are giving a, um, a estrogen modulator um, a selective estrogen modulator which is producing this so if we're going clomifen for example we change to hmg human menopausal gonadotropins or fsh therapy because this will uh, not affect the cervical mucus negatively uh, then if we think that there are anti uh, uh, bodies uh, some people like to use corticosteroids to diminish their effect and therefore as said before we give these corticosteroids on day 21 to 28 of uh, the woman's cycle so that by next cycle by day 12 of next cycle these corticosteroids would have produced their effects and therefore uh, theoretically or maybe practically they would diminish the anti uh, bodies and then allow the sperm to penetrate we should again uh, repeat the test to see if it is working or not then some people had advised in the past to do condom therapy they said well if the woman is developing antibodies against her husband's sperm then let us prevent her husband's sperm from coming near her therefore prevent them from having intercourse for six months and if they want to have intercourse then they would have the intercourse using a condom and theoretically by doing this the uh, uh, amount of antibodies in her body the titer is going to diminish of course it is not uh, a good uh, treatment it has not uh, been shown to work and of course a lady who's coming to uh, because she wants to have a child then we tell her well we want you to wait for another six months because we have a, uh, a certain uh, doubtful therapy which may or may not work so it has never been uh, really uh, used uh, uh, seriously in uh, in, in treating uh, women with and uh, anti-sperm antibodies and finally we have the intrauterine insemination as i said uh, to cut a long story short if we have a negative post test we do the intrauterine insemination 
And how do we do this? We cannot take the sperm as it is, as I said, we, uh, we, and put it inside the uterine cavity. Uh, the, the, uh, semen, uh, the seminal plasma contains uh, prostaglandins and other substances, in particular prostaglandin F2-alpha, which is going to produce contractions, uh, and it's going to uh, and the uterus is going to throw the sperm outside of it. Therefore, if we are going to put the sperm inside the uterus and do intrauterine insemination, we have to prepare the sperm. We have to separate the spermatozoa from the seminal plasma by, by one of the methods. Uh, and the first method, as maybe we said before, is the swim-up test, where we put the sperm, where the semen, which is in blue here, underneath a layer of culture medium uh, shown here in red and this culture medium contains the proper osmolarity and proper ph and proper nutrients for the sperm and we leave them for uh, half an hour for example and leave uh, um, and then they, the good sperm will migrate uh, to the culture medium then we go take the culture medium and use it for our insemination uh, maybe uh, to concentrate it a little bit as shown here we would do centrifugation uh, for 10 minutes and then take the pellet and use it for the, our intrauterine insemination because we don't like to put inside the uterine cavity more than 0.2 milliliters because this is the capacity of the uterine cavity otherwise they are not going to stay in the uterine cavity uh, and again as you can see in the bottom part of this uh, slide um, that uh, we may during the lay, uh, laying out of the swim up technique we may, we can um, put the, um, the the tubes the test tubes uh, we can incline them a little bit to increase the surface area for the to facilitate the migration of the spermatozoa now another method is the separation by percol and maybe as i said before percol is something like sand like uh, silica so and you put the, your semen on top of this uh, percol and then you do centrifugation and then the good sperms are going to penetrate through the percol and the cocoon to give you a pellet then we remove this pellet and uh, ideally we would do another uh, swim up test uh, swim up step as we can see here and then take the, um, the supernatant and use it for intrauterine insemination of course this needs a semen sample that has a good concentration of spermatozoa so if the problem is oligospermia we cannot really do this but if it is for example because is that the sperm contains some debris or contains some uh, uh, parcels maybe so this is an ideal method to separate the good spermatozoa from these uh, debris enough for the cervical mucus and then let's uh, start to look at the tubal problems in infertility and in the famous study by Hull he found that 14 percent of infertility um, uh, cases were due to tubal uh, problems so uh, we remind ourselves with this diagram of what happens in the fallopian tube we know that the fallopian tube is the site of fertilization because fertilization occurs in the uh, umpullary part of the fallopian tube so we need to have a fallopian tube not only patent but also we need the, um, the, the fimbria to be able to uh, to be free to collect the oocyte uh, at the time of ovulation uh, so what are the causes of tubal factor infertility uh, well infection is an important uh, cause uh, infection which may lead to uh, adhesions inside the fallopian tube itself or uh, around the fallopian tube uh, leading um, preventing the fallopian tube from being free to collect the uh, oocyte at the time of uh, um, uh, ovulation as i said and maybe these adhesions will block the uh, tube altogether uh, and this can be due to infection but the other cause of producing adhesions is a surgery and sometimes we need to remove the, the, the fallopian tube because we had an ectopic pregnancy for example Another cause for uh, producing adhesions in the tube or on the tube is endometriosis. And finally, uh, there are congenital anomalies. Uh, the woman may be born without a fallopian tube or with one fallopian tube or other anomalies uh, uh, as we uh, know. Uh, for example, here in the upper panel, we have lumen obstruction. And this lumen obstruction can be due on the left side to atresia of the fallopian tube. A woman who was born 
with an attractive fallopian tube and therefore blocked fallopian tube. This is quite rare actually. But on the right side, we have another woman who has a blocked tube due to salpingitis, inflammation of the fallopian tube, and then phimosis, which means that the opening has diminished, has become a pinhole os, as you can hear, uh, can see here because of the different adhesions. Uh, on the other hand, on the lower panel, uh, the fallopian tube is not blocked but it is stretched over an ovarian cyst on the left side and over a fibroid on the right side, uh, um, compressing the cavity of the fallopian tube and therefore affecting its uh, function. Again, adhesions, as said before, which can be a peritubular adhesions, we can be fimbrial adhesions and different forms of adhesions, the end result of which uh, is that the fallopian tube is not capable of collecting the oocyte at the time of ovulation or cannot transmit the oocyte to the, the, the sperm because of obstruction. Then endometriosis, as said before, of course, endometriosis uh, can lead to adhesions, as uh, we all know, and these adhesions can lead to blockage of the tube or production of so how do we assess, how do we evaluate the tubal factor? Uh, there are um, three methods really. The histosalpingography, the sonohistosalpingography, and finally the laparoscopy. So histosalpingography, um, we inject um, dye, a radio-opaque dye inside the fallopian, uh, inside the uterine cavity, and it goes through the fallopian tube and it will show us whether the tubes are patent or uh, blocked. Now, this should be done uh, in the first uh, part of the cycle. We should not wait until the woman ovulates because she may be pregnant already. So we should do this really after uh, menstruation because, again, we don't want to do it during menstruation because it's going to force uh, the endometrium into the uh, uterine cavity and the uh, peritoneal cavity, and therefore the woman may start developing endometriosis. So we don't want this. We wait until the... Uh, menstruation is over, so we would do it on day 7, 8, 9, 10 of the cycle, uh, and again before uh, ovulation. As you can see here, a catheter through which we inject uh, the radio and then uh, our, uh, the uh, uh, x-ray uh, is done. And as you can see here, this is a normal hysterosalpingogram where the dye has passed through the uterus. There are no filling defects in the uterus, and again, the dye has passed through the right and left fallopian tube and the, it is uh, uh, freely distributed in the, uh, in the peritoneal cavity. Uh, on the contrary, uh, we see here pathological histosalpingograms. On the left side, we have a unilateral obstruction. As you can see, the, the dye has gone through one of the tubes, but it has not gone through the other tube. And on the right side, it has not gone through either tube. So we will have bilateral tubal obstruction. Uh, again, we can have hydrosalpings, as you can see on the left side here. The uh, dye has gone into the left, uh, into the right tube, as you can see, but it has accumulated in the tube and it's not going passing through. Uh, on the right side, uh, we have a uterus, which is a biconic uterus, uh, but again, the dye is not freely distributed in the, the uterine cavity, uh, telling us that probably there are some adhesions uh, around uh, both tubes. Uh, the other simpler alternative is to do the sono histosalpingogram, to do it with x-ray. And then what do we inject? We inject um, a liquid which can be uh, eco, um, uh, pay, uh, opaque, uh, so it will show by um, ultrasound. Uh, but of course, the ultrasound is not like the x-ray. It takes um, a, a section so our section may not come through the fallopian tube. On the right side, we see a, a sonohistosalpingogram, which has been done, and luckily the doctor has gone through the, um, his section came through the um, fallopian tube, and you can see that the fallopian tube is patent because uh, some of the, the dye has gone through. We can do this with a dye, but simply we can also do it with saline, and people uh, um, used to uh, shake the saline in order to produce some uh, very tiny bubbles in order to be radio-opaque. 
it's not a good idea and really the good the, the advantage of this technique is maybe to see the uterine cavity as a polyp in the uterine cavity but trying to check uh, whether the tubes are patent or not with this technique is not really a very good idea uh, but the good idea is laparoscopy so we know laparoscopy we inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide we cannot put air because uh, air can produce air embolism uh, or other gases we put co2 because co2 can be uh, dissolved in uh, in the blood uh, of course it's going to uh, if we uh, continue for a long time our operation for a long time we may end up by having acidosis but of course nobody uh, should do this so but the laparoscope through the laparoscope we can have a look inside the tummy and see exactly uh, whether there are adhesions or not at the same time we can inject the dye from the cervix and see if it goes through the fallopian tubes uh, or not and as you can see here this is a photo of uh, the, um, uh, proper photo taken through the laparoscope showing the uterus and on the right side we have an ovary and the right left side we have another ovary with uh, a growing follicle there and uh, uh, we have here number one is the uterus number two is the round ligament number three is the uh, uh, fallopian tube and number four is the ovarian ligament which is attaching uh, the uh, ovary to uh, uh, the back of the uterus uh, here are some pathological findings. Uh, um, uh, top left, we see adhesions um, blocking, uh, in fact, obliterating the, the Douglas pouch. And on the right side, we, we can see a biconic uterus. Uh, on the uh, right uh, bottom side, uh, there is no nothing pathological. We can see that the dye has gone through the tube. We can see that the, the, the tubes are a little bit dilated, but uh, in my opinion, they have they are patent and we should give her uh, a trial uh, to become pregnant and on the left side we see endometriosis which has produced adhesions on the right side and on the left side uh, and again this can affect uh, the, the ability of the tube to uh, collect the oocyte so what is the treatment if you find that the lady has a problem uh, in her fallopian tubes uh, medical treatment really, uh, there's very little in terms of uh, medical treatment that you can do, but surgical correction has been uh, tried before, and this can be done by open laparotomy, but uh, better would be being done by operative laparoscopy. And then people have also tried tubal cannulation, but uh, the best treatment uh, so far has been assisted reproduction, in particular in vitro fertilization. So medical treatment, for example, if we have an infection, we can give antibiotics, but sometimes the infection is tuberculous infection, which destroys the, the fallopian tubes, really. Um, it doesn't matter if we have treated the tuberculosis, the pathology has already been done. And in fact, if we've done, if we treat an infection and the pathology has already been done, it's very difficult, uh, if, not, if uh, not impossible, to bring the fallopian ba uh, tube back to normal. Uh, endometriosis again some people do suppression therapy but of course during the suppression therapy the woman will not become pregnant and uh, in, in to use this method for uh, a patient who wants to become pregnant is not really a very good idea she has been trying for two or three or four or more years and then you're she comes to you you tell her i'm going to give you suppression therapy for a few more months and during these four, few more months you are not going to become pregnant so it's not really a logical treatment. Antispasmodics, if we have pain due to any of uh, the above causes, infrared therapy have been used in the past, but of course it is a waste of time. Repeated head intubation again is a waste of time. So there are very, there is very little we can do uh, with our medical treatment. Uh, but what sometimes can be done is to is uh, surgery. So like what, like tubal microsurgery. For example, this lady has block tubes but these block tubes were due to the fact that she went for uh, sterilization so she had a clean operation where the fallopian tube was uh, um, cut or, or maybe even um, cauterized but the rest of the tube is healthy as we can see here so what the surgeon is trying to do now is to approximate the two parts of the fallopian tube together trying to put a lumen 
in front in opposite to the other lumen taking his stitches from outside and doing this under the microscope and hoping for the best uh, this can be done of course for a uh, fallopian tube which has can be can, has been uh, severed uh, cleanly by a surgeon who has been um, cut because the lady didn't want to become pregnant she wanted to have sterilization and then uh, her condition changed she got uh, an, a new marriage for example and she wants to have uh, children uh, again and therefore uh, people try to uh, uh, do this and as you can see we can also do this by laparoscopy on the left side and the doctor he's looking by laparoscopy trying to remove the adhesions for example on the right side up in, uh, uh, in the uh, upper um, um, photo and in the lower photo also there are adhesions and the surgeon is trying to uh, cut them or cauterize them until they are cut but on the left side we have an endometriosis cyst called endometrioma and whether we should remove it or not remove it that's a big debate but uh, some people like to remove uh, the cyst and cauterize the, the wall of the cyst in order that we don't get it back but some people think that if you uh, fiddle with the ovarian cyst then and you use cauterization then you may affect the blood supply of the ovary and this on the long term is going to diminish the ovarian reserve of this lady so if she wants to become pregnant uh, after that or even if she wants to do assisted reproduction this is going to affect uh, her response to stimulation uh, and of course nowadays we have robotic surgery as you can see here it can be one doctor it can be a doctor and his uh, uh, assistant as you can see here. they are sitting they're not uh, um, in their uh, uh, operative uh, gear they're not sterilized they're working on these um, robotic robots and uh, the, while the other assistant or the nurse has already um, the um, gadgets are already inside the tummy of the lady so the doctors are working on the console as you can see but everything they were they're doing is being transported uh, into uh, the, uh, the patient uh, hysteros hysteroscopy again uh, uh, can uh, help in some patients if we think and uh, if we find that the obstruction has been at the level of the cornea of the uterus then uh, we can go through the uterus but with the hysteroscope and try to cannulate this are of course some very rare cases uh, because in many cases where you have uh, blocked cornea tube when the obstruction is the level of the cornea it is that uh, the lady had a spasm during the hysterosalpine geography or maybe even uh, the doctor uh, she, she was in pain during the procedure so uh, reflexly uh, she got this spasm or if uh, the doctor uh, uses a dye which is cold just taken out of the fridge it may induce again a spasm in the fallopian tube or uh, he is uh, in, in injected, uh, injecting the dye with some air in it and this again can affect um, the uh, result of the x-ray because it will tell us that the x-ray did not go through the fallopian tube but we have to be intelligent to see whether it didn't go because of an obstruction or because of a spasm so maybe we need to repeat it under an antispasmodic or even under anesthesia uh, because finally if all this doesn't work we can always resort to in vitro fertilization and in vitro fertilization has been done for women with blocked tubes in which case as i said we remove the uh, the oocytes from the ovary we stimulate the patient at the beginning we're going to talk about this later but we stimulate the patient to produce many oocytes and then we collect the oocytes and then uh, or at the same uh, time uh, on the same day we ask the, sp the husband to produce a semen sample and then we go to the laboratory we do the insemination in the laboratory and after two days or three days or four days or five days we put back our embryos as we can see in this diagram uh, the the next cause of infertility is really endometriosis and i may like to call it even the peritoneal factor in infertility uh, because we spoke about the previous factors 
it's not only important to have a clear fallopian tube, a patent fallopian tube, and have ovulation and uh, a, a good uh, postcoital test. Uh, um, the milieu uh, in the peritoneal cavity should be uh, good enough for the sperm and the egg to meet. Because uh, many people think that during ovulation, the oocyte falls in the cavity of the fallopian tube in the uh, cul de sac, cul de sac, the uh, Douglas pouch, and then it is recollected by the fimbri of the fallopian tube. We know this because we know in some patients who had an ectopic pregnancy, for example, if the tube, the left tube, has been removed, but the lady had ovulated from the left side, so. Uh, the egg gets collected from the right fallopian tube. So we know this. Uh, therefore, if the um, peritoneal cavity contains bad substances which will affect the fertilizing capacity of the sperm or the ability of those sites to be fertilized, then we will know we will have infertility. And we know that endometriosis uh, can do this. Now, endometriosis has four clinical presentations. Superficial endometriosis, uh, endometrioma, endometrial adhesions, and deep uh, endometriosis. And this is an example of superficial endometriosis, small spots on the peritoneum, which can be actually uh, cauterized uh, when we are doing our uh, even diagnostic uh, laparoscopy to see whether there is any um, endometriosis. As you can see, there are petechiae or small uh, nevi um, on the upper left side and the upper right side. Uh, but then these, with time, are going to uh, the beginning of their uh, uh, blood, and then it will produce hemosiderin, and then it will start doing, uh, becoming white endometriosis, which means that uh, uh, um, scarring has started, as you can see on the left side, lower left side, scarring uh, and surrounded by newly formed uh, endometrial uh, petechiae. Uh, the second uh, presentation, clinical presentation, is an endometrioma, uh, a cyst which of endometriosis or endometriosis cyst. And as long as it is uh, contained like this and, not, and uh, with a capsule not open, uh, it uh, will not produce adhesions, but it can produce substances which can prevent the sperm and the oocytes from uh, producing a good fertilization. Uh, the third presentation is adhesions, endometriosis adhesions, which result from uh, all sorts of endometriosis and can at, end up, as we can see with these adhesions, which can uh, prevent the um, oocytes from meeting the egg, preventing the uh, fallopian tube from collecting the oocyte uh, properly. Uh, and finally, deep infiltrating endometriosis. Now, for example, as you can see on the left side, endometriosis in the uh, uh, recto-vaginal uh, septum, which is difficult to remove and uh, is actually dangerous because we can injure uh, the rectum uh, or the vagina or both. So why, what are the causes of infertility with endometriosis? As said, uh, of course, if the lady has pelvic adhesions, we all understand, they, are, they can block the tubes. Uh, also, uh, we will know that endometriosis uh, occurs in women with hyperestrenemia. In women with high estrogen, by definition, uh, we, they may have a defective progesterone. So they all have some degree of ovarian dysfunction. So, and this is, can be another cause of infertility in these women if uh, they don't have adhesions. And also, if they don't have adhesions, uh, the cause may be. Uh, yeah, due to the presence of peritoneal macrophages and prostaglandin and cytokines, in particular uh, interleukin 1 and interleukin 6. And as you can see here in this photo, this is very mild endometriosis, or uh, mild endometriosis, I would call it, but you have a definite endometriosis. You have these uh, spots which, with time, are going to produce, as I said, uh, different forms of endometriosis, and they may end up in scarring and adhesion formation. So what is the treatment of endometriosis-associated infertility? We have a lady who is infertile, and we have examined her and looked by laparoscopy and found that she has uh, endometriosis. 
uh, well, expectant treatment has been tried, but we also have the medical treatment, surgical treatment, endoscopic treatment, and also in vitro fertilization. So what about expectant uh, treatment? It doesn't really uh, um, add much. We know always that if we wait for a little while, people will become pregnant. But normally, people will not come to the clinic until they have tried for a little while without having a treatment. So then... We can try the other sorts of medical treatment like progesterone therapy. Of course, I mean, this is suppression therapy. You suppress ovulation in order uh, uh, to, um, as a treatment for endometriosis. But of course, if you do this, the woman is not going to become pregnant. So these sorts of treatments are good for women who have endometriosis where the problem is not infertility. It may be pain, for example. She has three children. She has completed her family. And the problem now is pain. So in this case, we can give her progesterone suppression therapy, oral contraceptives, danazole, GnRH agonist and antagonist, uh, Dynogest, and also aromatase inhibitors. But all these are, are, are treatments which are going to be uh, to, to prevent ovulation. If the lady, even if the lady has uh, some degree of ovulation, it will uh, 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 prevent ovulation altogether. So, and there is also no evidence of efficacy in the treatment because some people say, well, I will give you this treatment for three months and then wait, then you will, this will improve your chances of pregnancy. And the short answer is that it does not. So what can we do? We can do surgical treatment. And surgical treatment has been shown to uh, be more beneficial in these patients. Uh, for example, on the upper left side, uh, we can cauterize the if we do a laparoscopy and we find that there are small um, spots of endometriosis, we better cauterize them. We can cauterize them with heat, we can cauterize them with laser, we can cauterize them with uh, harmonic scalpel and different sort of, uh, of gadgets. And again, as you can see here, but again, you can see on the right side, uh, upper panel, we have a cyst and the doctor has penetrated the cyst and the uh, fluid, the brown fluid of endometriosis has started to trickle, so he has a suction um, instrument, he is trying to suck it as soon as it comes out. Then he will go inside the cavity and cauterize the wall of the cavity from inside, so that it doesn't produce another cyst of endometriosis. Now what about deep infiltrating endometriosis? As I said, if we are going to do an operation for this, we need a surgeon who is really um, uh, um, specialized in this form of surgeries because they are uh, kind of risky and they are associated with uh, serious complications. And as I said, again, we can use robotic surgery. And finally, if uh, all these treatments do not uh, get us a pregnancy, then we can always resort to in vitro fertilization. And as I said before, we stimulate the lady, we give her um, uh, treatment uh, like FSH or HMG to produce many oocytes. We collect the oocytes uh, normally by transvaginal ultrasound, as you do, everybody does now. Uh, and then we ask the husband to produce a semen sample. Then we put the sperm with the oocytes, and after 24 hours we check, and, and then we put them back after 48 hours or 72 hours, or we may like to wait until day five and put them in the uh, blastocyst stage. We are going to discuss this, of course, in part four. Uh, then we are left with the uterine cav factor in infertility. Uh, the woman may have everything normal and her husband is normal, but she's not becoming pregnant because she has a problem in the uterus. Like, for example, congenital anomalies. She may have a small uterus congenitally, or she may have no uh, uterus altogether. Uh, she may have a septum, she may have, as we are going to see, uh, she may have adhesions inside the uterus, intratranscyneke, which we call uh, Asherman syndrome. She may have fibromyomata, or she may have adeno meiosis for that matter. And these are the different congenital anomalies, uh, the famous ones like the uterus, the delphus, the acute uterus, 
uh, the bicornic uterus and the uterine septum. And it is important here to differentiate between the septum and the bicornic uterus because the septum, if we go with the hysteroscope and we cut the septum, well and good, this would be good treatment. But if we go into a bicornic uterus and we think that this is a septum, then if we are going to remove this, what we think is a septum, we're going to do a perforation of the uterus, which is a serious uh, complication again. And as said, uh, we may have intratranscynechia, intratran adhesions. Uh, we call them uh, Asherman syndrome, and they usually due uh, to an infection. They are due to a DNC, which has been done uh, for secondary postpartum hemorrhage, for example. If we do a DNC for a woman who has uh, an infection in the inside the uterus, uh, my um, endometritis, for example, uh, we will not feel the gritty sensation we always do if we do uh, a DNC for uh, a lady who is not pregnant. So in this case, uh, the doctor may keep on uh, doing uh, curatage and uh, without uh, realizing that he has gone through the stratum basalis and therefore uh, this woman is going to uh, develop intratrand adhesions and she will not get to have uh, her uh, periods after that. Uh, another cause of uterine uh, factor infertility is the presence of uh, fibromyomata. And fibromyomata can be submucous, can be intramural, or can be sub subserous. Of course, the subserous ones uh, do not affect uh, uh, pregnancy, again, regardless of the size and so on. They don't produce uh, infertility. Uh, uh, and those who are inside the um, um, submucus need to be removed because uh, most of the cases they are going to be to affect the implantation of uh, the embryo. But the problem is those who are intramural. So the uh, accepted wisdom is that if, it's, uh, if it is encroaching on the cavity of the uterine cavity, then they need to be removed. So if they're accessible from hysteroscopy, from below, uh, well and good. If not, they should be done by uh, laparotomy or laparoscopy. Uh, the other problem with the uterus which can affect uh, the fertility of the woman is the presence of adenomyosis. And as you know, adenomyosis is the presence of endometrial glands uh, inside the um, myometrium, as we can see on the right side. And this leads to a, a bulky uterus, uh, which is uh, softish on examination, and again, uh, uh, heavy uh, menstrual bleeding. Uh, so how do we evaluate the uterine factor in infertility? There are many methods, of course. Ultrasound is the first one, then we have hysterography, uh, then uh, sonohysterography, uh, laparoscopy also, hysteroscopy also, and finally, magnetic uh, resonance imaging. So this is the ultrasound. If we have 3D or 4D ultrasound, it's even better, as we can see in the upper panel, because it gives us a good picture. And in particular, it can differentiate between the uterine septum and the uh, bicornic uterus. Because as said before, uh, if we get the wrong diagnosis, we may find ourselves inside the, the uh, peritoneal cavity and uh, but, uh, but there, are, there are other congenital anomalies some of these anomalies can be seen by UT ultrasound as you can see in the uh, lower left uh, photo showing a bicornic uterus which is seen by uh, a 2D ultrasound hysterosalpingography as said before it is really hysterography uh, so, for example, upper right, we find that there is a fibroid inside of the, the uterine cavity. Anybody examining this lady will find that she has a bulky uterus, but he will not know that she has uh, this fibroid unless he does a hysterosterography, as we can see here, or maybe a sonohysterography, or, or, uh, uh, some time, uh, or a hysteroscopy. Again, uh, by coordinate uterus can be seen by hysterosalpic geography, and intratranscynechia, of course, can be also be seen uh, uh, if the uterus is not normal, as you can see on the upper left side. Sono 
hysterography again is a, uh, the other technique I've been describing before. Uh, you inject a uh, saline or a substance like icosine, which is a, re uh, a sono opaque substance. We inject it and then it will show you if there's anything in the uterine cavity like uterine polyps. As you can see here, we have three of them beautifully shown and also maybe another small one. Uh, laparoscopy is also uh, good to uh, because it's going to give us a diagnosis of biconic uterus for example if this has not been done by for the ultrasound and usually we combine laparoscopy with uh, uh, to have a look at the fallopian tube at the same time tubes and inject the dye as you can see here there's a blue dye in the uh, Douglas pouch showing that the tubes are probably patent in this lady Again, uh, doing a laparoscopy can show us that the uterus has a posterior wall fibroid. Then it's also a cervical fibroid, as you, if you can see here. Uh, again, hysteroscopy uh, is the golden standard, as I said. And you can see on the left side a normal hysteroscopy. Then in the middle, we can see a polyp. On the right side, we can see a synechi, which needs to be uh, cut off in order for the patient to have a good chance of pregnancy. And here is adenomyosis. And said, although the adenomyosis can be suspected by 3D ultrasound or 4D ultrasound, as you can see it, it is mostly diagnosed by MRI. You can see in MRI on the right side, the different uh, um, islands of uh, endometrium which are placed on the posterior wall of this bulky uterus and there is of course an association between adenomyosis and fibroids you can have a small fibroid uh, besides uh, an area of adenomyosis in any uh, lady so what is the treatment of uterine factor infertility now if we have uterine anomalies and we can correct them then correction of uterine anomalies if we have a fibroid which we think that it is affecting our fertility so we would go for myomectomy because of course we need to uh, keep the uterus the woman wants to become pregnant and this can be also done by laparoscopic myomectomy as you can see here we don't need to do uh, an open uh, uh, laparotomy to remove the uterus anymore in many of the patients now another uh, uh, method of treatment is a hysteroscopic polypectomy of course if there's a polyp inside the uh, the uterine cavity this uh, needs to be taken by a hysteroscope uh, so this is hysteroscopic polypectomy and also if we have adhesions these can be dissected by uh, uh, through the hysteroscope uh, if we have a fibroid uh, we will go for myomectomy, and this can be done through laparotomy, as you can see, but can be also done by laparoscopy, and even better by robotic surgery. As you can see here, the surgeon has done an incision through which he's going to remove the fibroid and then uh, close it again. We always like to do our incisions uh, on the front side of the uterus as much as we can in order not to produce adhesions on the posterior aspect of the of the uterus where the fallopian tubes and the ovaries are. But in this case, it was apparently difficult to do this because the fibroid was totally in the posterior aspect of the uterus. Uh, operative hysteroscopy, I said about, on the left side, there is a polyp and the doctor is removing it by operative laparoscopy. And on the right side, we have adhesions and the doctor is trying to uh, cut through with the adhesions uh, as you can see here and finally unexplained infertility so if we have done all this and we still don't know the reason then this is unexplained infertility so what is the def so what is the definition of unexplained infertility what are the possible causes of unexplained infertility because sometimes people say well I have a patient with unexplained infertility and you ask her and you ask him, did you do a postcultural test? They say, no, we haven't done this. Did you do progesterone in the middle of TLF? He says, no, I only looked by ultrasound. I found a nice uh, rounded black thing, which I think is a, is a follicle. So, of course, 
we have to exhaust our examination before labeling a patient with unexplained infertility. For example, we need to have a negative post-cultural test at the time of ovulation. Uh, there is uh, something that people uh, call the Luff syndrome, the utilized and ruptured follicle syndrome, because they have seen the patient with a nice follicle and uh, on day 12 or 13, and then came back on day 14 and 15 and found that the the the, this thing is still present, and they do, uh, uh, and they think that this is a luteinized and ruptured follicle. Well, uh, this is of course very uh, controversial because the corpus luteum can form and can look like a follicle. Uh, that's number one, and uh, number two, do we have a luteinized and uh, uh, ruptured follicle uh, a case, or do we have a syndrome? Meaning that if Really, this happens in on one occasion. Does this mean that it is going to be uh, happening forever in the same patient? That is going to have to repeat itself in every cycle. So we really have to. This is why many people don't really take this last syndrome seriously. Uh, luteal phase defect is important. It's not important just to say that the lady has ovulated because I have seen something uh, black which has popped out of the uh, of, of the, the the ovary. Uh, um, I said. Uh, ovulation is degrees. We need to have a good luteinization. We need progesterone to rise high enough to support a pregnancy and to build the endometrium in the proper fashion to support the pregnancy until uh, the time when the placenta will take over. Then, minimal endometriosis, because people, when they do endometriosis, are they expert enough? to spot these little spots of endometriosis, the so-called white endometriosis, the so-called clear endometriosis, the so-called uh, uh, spots of, of endometriosis. So sometimes the doctor has done a laparoscopy, has not done a laparoscopy in the first place, or has done a laparoscopy, and he was not uh, vigilant enough to look carefully for minimal endometriosis. And finally, another cause of unexplained infertility is uh, fertilization failure. Everything is fine. The semen analysis looks fine, and the lady is ovulating. The fallopian tubes are clear. The uterus is normal. Uh, we don't have any endometriosis, and still she is not becoming pregnant. So we decide to do IVF for her. We take her for uh, oocytes, and we put it with the semen of the husband, and we discover that the semen of the husband is not fertilizing the egg. It, uh, the semen can look nice, can look good, it is uh, moving uh, uh, normally, but when it uh, uh, meets the oocyte, it does not fertilize the oocyte, and therefore these patients need ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And as you can see, because this is how the sperm penetrates the oocytes, this picture taken by scanning electron microscopy. So what do we do in these patients? We have a couple who have been exhaustively investigated. We discovered everything is normal. Then. Are we going to leave them? No. The first step is to do controlled ovarian hyperstimulation plus intrauterine insemination. Not ovarian controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. We know that this lady is ovulating if she's unexplained infertility, but we still are going to give her FSH therapy or HMV therapy. Uh, so that instead of producing one oocyte, she will produce four or five or even six, a good number of oocytes. And then we will in, uh, prepare our semen and we are going to do intrauterine insemination at the same time. Uh, so if uh, the, this treatment, we can do this once or two, twice, and if it doesn't work, then we would expect total fertilization failure, TFF, and in which case we are going to do a combined uh, cycle of IVF and ICSI. We, do, we start with, the, with uh, stimulating the patient, as we would do in assisted production. Then she will develop, hopefully, a good number of follicles. We go do our egg uh, retrieval, or site retrieval. Then these oocytes, we are going to divide them into two. Some of them we are going to do IVF, and some of them we are going to do ICSI to see whether really these, this couple, they have failure of fertilization or what? And at the same time, uh, we are not going to do IVF for all the oocytes we collect because all of them may not get fertilized. So at least we will have some of them fertilized, but we will know 
uh, uh, the answer why these people are not becoming pregnant and if she does not become pregnant or if she wants to become pregnant in the future she can always have uh, ICSI intercytoplasmic sperm injection uh, and this is the combined uh, IVF and ICSI as you can see we have seen this uh, diagram before uh, on the left side we have the conventional IVF what meaning that we put the oocytes with the sperm uh, giving them um, the um, ability to fertilize the egg on them or, uh, from themselves but at the other side we will are going to take uh, the other half of the oocytes and we are going to do intracytoplasmic sperm injection so by the end of these three parts we would like to stop and think about the management of the infertile couple so what do we do we have a couple who came to us after 18 months or two years of trying to become pregnant and they did not achieve a pregnancy so we sit with them we ask them two things the husband should do the semen analysis and the woman should do the day 21 progesterone and we see in them the following visit on day 12 or 13 of the cycle to do the postcortical test so if the semen analysis turned out to be bad the husband should be referred to the male uh, infertility clinic or to our colleague the androgynist if the lady is not ovulating properly if progesterone is low we are going to investigate uh, why she is not ovulating properly like we said before and give her the proper treatment but then again see here again on day 20 or day 12 or 13 of the cycle having had intercourse the day before uh, for the post cortical test and if the post cortical test is, keeps becoming negative we would think and we know that this lady is ovulating properly and that the sperm of the husband are good the semen analysis is good then this must be a cervical factor in fertility so we look if there is a cause which we should treat if not we should do intrauterine insemination but if the post cortical test is positive and everything semen analysis is good day 21 progesterone is good and the post cortical test is good the lady must become pregnant if she is not becoming pregnant we would suspect something in the fallopian tubes so in this case we would start by doing hysterosalpingography and if we discover that there is any factor that can be treated we would do it for example we may have a septum or we have uh, any cause of a polyp intratum polyp then we will refer her or we will do a hysteroscopy for her uh, but if the hysterosalpingogram is normal and again she is not becoming pregnant then we will go for laparoscopy and hysteroscopy at the same time looking at whether there is endometriosis whether there is anything that we cannot see by 3d ultrasound for the ultrasound which you can see by hysteroscopy and of course if there is a problem at this level if there's endometriosis we will treat as endometriosis and if there is uh, a uterine factor we will treat this uterine factor like a presence of a polyp or a fibroid or anything of the sort because what remains if we do all this and the, pay, the couple do not achieve a pregnancy then we would label this couple as unexplained infertility and as i said start by doing two cycles of uh, control ovarian hyperstimulation plus plus uh, iui and if it doesn't work then we would go for uh, assisted uh, reproduction Uh, so uh, finally as promised there is a controversy regarding the post cortical test and now the post cortical test was introduced uh, by James Marion Sims a famous uh, New York obstetrician in 1860 but uh, what was meant with this uh, test was to make sure that uh, intercourse happens normally because sometimes the husband would say that uh, well the couple would not understand exactly what whether they were having proper intercourse or not or the husband may be impotent so James Marion Sims wanted to make sure that the sperms reach the vagina and he would he was probably taking the sample from the vagina but this is not what is meant by the test because the test was standardized after this particularly by Professor Vaclav Insler and Gordon Swire and also with the work of uh, Kamran, Professor Kamran Mugisi from Michigan and uh, uh, other people and for Professor Jan Kramer uh, from Holland and so on and by 1972 
uh, with this standardization by the group of Israel, Professor Insler, Professor uh, Lunenfeld, uh, David Sayer, and uh, Dr. Melvid, um, the test was standardized, meaning what? Uh, meaning that the patient would come at the time of operation and uh, having had intercourse the night before, not two or three hours beforehand, and she would have uh, a mucus removed with a tuberculin uh, syringe. Now, this test is not a test for long-term fertility potential as said. It is meant to evaluate the reservoir function of the cervix. And this has to be properly understood because people talk about different things when they talk about the post coital test. Some people take the sample from the vagina, which is not the case. Some people do the test after two or three hours after intercourse, and this should not be uh, ideal because the sperm will survive anyway uh, for two anywhere for, for two or three hours up to five hours, as said before. It is a function. It is a. Uh, it evaluates the reservoir function of the cervix. Because in 1998, uh, the group of Oi and his colleagues conducted a randomized controlled trial, a prospective randomized controlled trial, to see whether this test is of value or not. And after two years, they had two groups. A group they did the postcultural test, and another group they did the postcultural test. Whether the test was positive or negative, the, those who achieved the pregnancy after two years was the same. So they concluded from that uh, that the postcultural test is of no value. But of course, they were using the wrong methodology, and this was criticized by David, uh, by uh, Professor Hull and Professor Hans Evers in, uh, this, in 1999. They told them, you are using the wrong methodology. Uh, randomized controlled trials are not meant to evaluate a prospective test. They are meant to compare two treatments, and you are, you are not doing two treatments. Uh, if you consider this treatment, what you should have done is a receiver operating characteristic curve, which they have not done. So it is, the study was uh, criticized because of the wrong methodology used. And in fact, we have done some work in this area. In, in, two, in the year 2000, we published a paper on 192 pregnant patients. They became pregnant in the cycle where we did the post test. And what we discovered is that rarely can the patient become pregnant if the post test is negative. They cannot, they, they cannot become pregnant when the post test at the time of ovulation is negative. Of course, the test can be positive and the patient does not become pregnant because pregnancy depends on many factors. One of them is post test. But to become pregnant with a negative post test, this does not happen. In fact, it happened in 2% only of the studied uh, group. So, uh, however, uh, um, people uh, with time, with the development of assisted reproduction, people found that uh, it is easier for them to go straight to IVF and ICSI, and they started to bypass the post test, not to do the post test, and go straight to IVF and ICSI. Uh, the patients are happy, the doctors are happy, but of course, for the sake of economy and common sense, one should always uh, do the post test because uh, the patient does not only want to become pregnant and have uh, um, a beautiful child, she also wants to do this at uh, the minimal uh, cost uh, involved. And this is not being done by bypassing the post test. Uh, and with this, I come to the end of my presentation, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention and to remind you that this is uh, part three of a four-part presentation. First part about male factor infertility, the second part of the ovarian factor infertility, the third part of today, and the next part, the fourth part, is going to be about assisted uh, reproduction. Thank you uh, very much.